Yay! Welcome! Welcome to Positive Discipline TV. This is our monthly show created in partnership between Positive Discipline and Sproutable, designed to highlight the voices, wisdom, and diversity of Positive Discipline parent educators directly to the communities that we serve. As trainers and coaches, we know that this work is powerful and so messy. And with PDTV, we're hoping to bring the practice of positive discipline to life and leave you all feeling empowered and encouraged to carry it on inside of your own families. I'm Casey O'Rourke, positive discipline lead trainer, coach, and adolescent lead at Sproutable. And this is my co-host, Julietta Skoog, also a positive discipline trainer and the early years maven at Sproutable. Each month, we're going to bring a different guest on to discuss how they are integrating positive discipline into their families and into the communities that they serve. We're really excited about our guests today, Natasha Nelson. And Julietta, you're going to take it away and tell everybody who Natasha is. I will. I'm so so proud to share our guest today. Natasha Nelson is a certified positive discipline educator, veteran, military spouse, and stay-at-home mother to two autistic Black girls. She served over seven years of exemplary leadership in the United States Army as an active duty staff sergeant, including two tours to Afghanistan. She focuses on traditional child rearing, motherhood balance, positive parenting, and autism acceptance. Natasha hosts positive discipline workshops focused on black and neurodiverse parents, specifically changing their mindset, managing stress and pent up frustration, extending grace and working through their trauma and triggers to transform their homes. She also teaches parenting the positive discipline way through a six week virtual interactive course. And through her company, Supernova Mama, she showcases real, honest, and accessible motherhood. Welcome, Natasha. I am so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So. I, I had chills. I've been practicing reading that bio out loud, and I had chills just once again reading it. Honestly, we've been, and as we we chatted before we came on to Zoom, the three of us, and we were just sharing how excited I've been to be in conversation with you. Just reading that bio alone, it's it's just incredible. And one of the things that I really appreciate is, and that we were talking about, is that you um, describe yourself as a mother to two autistic black girls. And I was going to ask just, you know, language is important. Mm -hmm. Asking about language representation matters in this way. And I worked with a lot of students with autism and the way that I was trained was to use that language students with autism and now serving a lot of families knowing that's not how they want to be referred to that they say, I have autistic children. And so I appreciate you putting that in your bio. Can you speak a little bit to that about just the languaging, even with how many different aspects of intersectionality you represent? Absolutely. So um, what I always like to say, because I, I, I respect everyone who says, you know, person first, I'm a person first outside of autism. But for me, autism is as much a part of me as being Black and being a woman. And so I don't say I'm a person first when someone says you're a woman, and I don't say I'm a person first when someone says you're black. Um, and so to me, I'm a black autistic woman. And that's just how I look at that. Yeah, that, thank you. I feel like that's like the clearest explanation I've ever received, even with all of my like training. So thank you. And we are so excited to learn about your positive discipline journey. How did you discover positive discipline? What was your journey like? Share it with us. Absolutely. So um, initially, when me and my husband decided we were ready for children, um, I came from a really rough childhood and so did my husband. Um, there was a lot of different trauma. There was some abuses. There were different things there. And so we just definitely wanted to do something that was completely different from what we grew up in. And I was a very... Um, some communities call it crunchy. In a black community, we call it woo-woo uh, type of person. Uh, like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I wanted to cloth diaper. I wanted to breastfeed. I wanted to baby wear. I wanted to do attachment parenting. I wanted to do baby lead waning. And so I, um, all of those things kind of led me to Montessori. And then the people who were practicing Montessori, especially Montessori at home, um, led me to Maria Montessori's 
specifically because what I saw on the internet was not something I could do and I wanted to do Montessori my way. Um, so specifically to her workings and then that and the people who were doing that also led me to positive discipline because they were like, oh, well, you know, Montessori is just up until six years old. But if you're really wanting to get into this and go further, you should look into gentle parenting. And so I looked into gentle parenting and some of the gentle parenting was um, not balanced. I wanted balance um, and it just coming from a black family, just in, in the different things, I wanted a balance. And a lot of things, some of those things were with conscious parenting and gentle parenting, it was kind of my child is a sentient being. And if they don't want to brush their teeth, their teeth can just rot out. And I was like, oh, uh, that's a little too far for me. I need something more in the middle there. Um, and it led me to positive discipline because that fine, kind and firm spoke out to me. Um, and, and I went deeper and I loved it. And I started implementing it in my home. Um, and I had mom blogged the whole time because I couldn't find other Black mothers who liked that balance, who were crunchy or woo-woo as well. Um, and so I started blogging so that if another young Black mother who wanted to do those things didn't know where to start, she would have an example. Um, and when people saw what I was doing with my children, they started asking questions. They started asking to pay me to give them lessons. And I said, well, then I have to get certified. And so that's when I looked into getting certified in positive discipline. Well, and I feel like Natasha, I love your story, first of all. It's so interesting to hear the, the path that, that every single one of us has taken that has led us to what we're doing right now. Um, you and I met, was it the Art of Facilitation workshop? Of facilitation. Is that, yep, Nadine and Yogi were teaching Art of Facilitation. That was the first time I met you. And I felt drawn to you and connected to you because I felt like we were both two people in the class who were like ready to raise our hands. Like we're those people. <laughs> and, I, and we were invited to like create space for the more quiet people to have their turn. And I could just see you even on the Zoom screen, like, Okay, how much space do we have to give? How much quiet do we need to endure before we jump in? So just tell it so felt connected to you right off the bat um, in humor and just same, same, right? Uh, I would so so your journey and people reaching out to you and you getting certified, can you talk a little bit about tell us about the parents that are finding you and um and the communities that you're really showing up as a leader inside of? Absolutely. So uh, to be honest, it's kind of, uh, and this is where my social media, media manager kind of gets mad at me too. It's kind of all over the place, but, <laughs> and what I mean by that is my focus, who I, who I learn, who I study for is black and neurodivergent families, but I get everyone. Um, and, and I don't just get families. I get a lot, a lot of black and multicultural young adults who are reparenting themselves. And they watch my videos and they get the information that I have to deal with trauma that they've had from being parented. Um, so that's one community that I have, is almost half of my community to be quite honest. They don't have children. They may be planning on having children, but they currently don't. And they just watch my videos. They get the information, they engage with my content because they've had such rough childhoods and they are looking to re reparent themselves to de learn de-stressing methods to learn different ways. Um, and then I have black neurodivergent um, and also a, a bit of um, gender non-binary um, and, and people who, who just feel different mm -hmm. um, that are parents who do come to me and I have, and that's the other half of my audience there. Um, and so even though I try to find other outlets, like when I get a parent who has a teen, I'll say, oh, I always send them straight to Casey or if I have a parent who, so, but a lot of times they will still come back and stay or at least follow my content and me. Um, but the focus is always um, black and neurodivergent families, mostly because that's what I know is experience. And I feel like a lot of times, yes, the information, the knowledge, the tools, the, the background information, Adler, foundational is important, but your experiences as a Black person are important. Your experiences as a neurodivergent person 
are important. And sometimes an educator who has all of that Adler background and all of that Eric Erickson background, they're not necessarily going to understand the nuances of being neurodivergent or understand the nuances of being Black. Yeah, there's something really powerful about learning from someone and really feeling like they, like I can say, I see myself in you and I see my experiences and your experiences for sure. And for anyone who's watching, you have got to check out Natasha's Instagram because she's talking about her videos, which are literally captured real live moments of Natasha and your husband mm -hmm. interacting with your girls in those you know, in the, in the joy and in the, and in the, in the conflict in all the different scenarios. And it's just like such a pure model for, I love watching your video. I mean, my kids are big. I love <laughs> watching your videos, Natasha, because they are so, they're just so pure. Right. And it's, it's real positive discipline in action, the messiness, it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. So everybody it's super Nova underscore mama. And mm -hmm. I can drop that in the chat. Uh, yeah. And Casey, while you're doing that, I just think the gem that you said, Natasha, that, you know, your focus and your audience might be black, neurodivergent, mm -hmm. non-binary, and yet positive discipline helps all. Like mm -hmm. literally that's the brilliance of it is that, you know, it's good for all people. And so there really is, you know, you get to show up to that community with your experience and it's such a, I can just only imagine like this safety, like womb that you create for your community, you know, and that's what, that's, that's kind of the brilliance of positive discipline is that it's really able to, you know, support all human beings and through your work, be able to really, you know, not necessarily like target, but have this focus. I have a thousand questions about like just your life. I mean, what, and my first, just before Casey takes over the mic, cause we're just going to be like literally grabbing the mic from each other. This entire conversation I can tell is, will you talk about how, like when you talk about neurodivergent, like what that means for you, having a diagnosis of autism, how, how it shows up for you as a person, what does that mean? Absolutely. So first, I, I always like to, just in case there's someone in the audience who doesn't even know what we're talking about when we say neurodivergent, uh, I like to address that. So neurodivergence is the idea basically that neurologically your brain works different and therefore you have a neurological disorder. That can look like autism, ADHD, sensory processing disorder, ADD, bipolar disorder, dyslexia, high functioning anxiety, depression, their giftedness, all on and on and on, but your brain is wired differently and you function differently and they call that a divergence. Um, if someone is, is, does not have a divergence, they're considered neurotypical. And if you have a family of fun, like I do, my husband has ADHD, I have autism, my oldest daughter has ADHD and autism, and my youngest daughter has autism, I call us the neurodiverse Nelsons, because there's a whole bunch in there. So those are those classifications and what those things mean. Um, and how that shows up. So First, it's a long journey, but we can talk about it. When I, when we decided to have our children, we have fertility issues um, and we had to get a lot of testing and things done. Um, and one of the things that they did once we had our third try, of course, tough conversation, but our third try um, was a quad test, uh, genetic testing, because my husband had sickle cell. Um, and when they did that quad test in Germany, which is where we were, they said we had the highest risk for having a genetic disorder that they'd ever seen. And so I immediately had to be put on bed rest and I was constantly uh, being monitored and checked at the hospital. And uh, up until about 36 weeks when, because they were only looking for chromosomal disorders. So, you know, those, those big things that you can see um, they said, oh, everything's fine. You're good. And I was able to have a natural birth and squat my daughter out. And everybody thought everything was fine. And then when I had my daughter, she was very quiet. 
Um, and you know, in, in most communities, it's like, oh, that's, she's just a good baby. And then I was, you know, baby wearing. And so she was always on me and they were like, oh, she's just a good baby. Hey, you were but just was, nailing it, Natasha. You were just <laughs> nailing it. That's exactly what everyone said. You're just amazing mom. First time. Woo. <laughs> um, but she, she really wasn't speaking. Um, and I was at home. I had decided to be at home. It was one of the things me and my husband had talked about. I was very big about my children uh, being me, being at home with my children uh, until they could at least speak. Uh, and so I was at home and with parents that at least speak didn't come, come as easily as other. And we started seeing other things that she didn't wave hello and goodbye. Um, that when we talked to her, she would not necessarily look at us, you know, different things like that. And I brought them up to the pediatrician in the military. And he was like, oh, we'll just give it time. You know, it's fine. And then when we, we moved, my husband decided he needed to get out of the military because he wasn't allowed to spend as much time with his children. And I was pregnant again. And so we decided to move to Atlanta. And when we got here, as soon as I got to the pediatrician and I voiced my concerns, he was like, oh, we need to do a MCHAT R an assessment and, and everything just started rolling because I was in a place with resources and that listened to black women. And so, <laughs> and so my daughter was diagnosed uh, with autism at two years old, my oldest. Um, when my daughter was diagnosed at two, my youngest was already in, was being entered into the uh, Babies Can't Wait program, which is the early intervention program, uh, which is basically like we think she might have autism, but first we want to do some intervention therapies, different things like that. And so it was looking like the youngest daughter was going to have autism as well. And I was looking at my daughters and the different things that they were doing that they were classifying as traits of autism. And I was like, I did that. I do that. I did that. It was just continual mirrors. <laughs> and, and when I went to my mom, um, because Long story short, me and my mom had a horrible relationship when I was a child. Um, I stopped talking to her as a young adult. And then when I decided to have children, I wanted to heal. We both went to therapy separately and then sit therapy together. So our relationship is repaired. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I went to my mom and I was like, mom, I think I might have autism. And she was like, well, what? And I started bringing the things that she was like, oh yeah, but that's just you being weird. I was like, yeah, the autism. So, and so I went to my primary care provider, voiced that, and she was like, you don't have to tell me all that. You're both of your children have autism. You think you might, we're just going to write you a referral. Mm -hmm. um, but the hard part was finding someone who actually diagnoses adults. Almost every provider is focused on children. It's like autism disappears once you become an adult. Uh, and so, or ADHD or any neurodiversity. And so everyone's focused on diagnosing children. Everyone's focused on helping and, and treating and giving support accessories to children. And there weren't very many resources for adults. And we aren't rich. We are very much a working class family. Mm -hmm. And so it had to be covered under my insurance. And so they, I ended up having to go through Emory University. They have a program. Uh, where they were doing studies on Black families because their Black families are so underdiagnosed. And I was able to go through that program uh, for free as long as I did everything I need to do in that program to get diagnosed. But that means it took over a year and a half because they have a wait list and they have all these things. Uh, so that is how I was diagnosed. And my girls were diagnosed a lot faster because um, amazing systems and me being an advocate and being able to be at home and go to all those appointments and push. So. I have a question. Hold yeah. up, Jules. <laughs> did it feel, Natasha, in your experience of going through that and getting the diagnosis, did it feel like, was there a sense of relief around like, oh, that's why? So I have, and this is going to be, well, we can be fine. It's positive discipline. You all have seen me at the conference and we can be friends. <laughs> I have felt <laughs> my whole life like I was an alien, um, but it's not something you talk about right? It's just yeah. something people are having conversations and you don't agree with those conversations or they don't make any sense to you, but you do it anyway because everybody else is doing it, right? Or 
Um, you want to do certain things. Like I used to chew paper. I was that kid. I was also the kid who hated anything being in my nose. So I would just blow my nose all the time if I was sick and had the snot running because I hated it in my nose. Um, I was the kid who I never, you, you see me moving everywhere here. I never stop moving. I have to move. There is no way I can stop motion. Even if I stand perfectly still here, my feet have this little pad under them right now that has sensory on it that I play with. I have to move. Mm. Um, and these things, I, I suck my fingers until I was in middle school. Uh, a young man said something very sexually explicit to me when I was sucking my fingers and I stopped because horror but not because I didn't want to do it anymore. And I continued to suck my fingers at home um, up until I'm leaving for college. And that was when my mom was like, all the people are going to see you. You, gonna, you can't suck your fingers there. But if someone would have given me an alternative, like a, a cup of water that I could suck from because the suction was what I needed, that was the stem, maybe I would have stopped sucking my fingers early. Okay. But I had so many things that made me feel like I was different and something was wrong with me. And we just don't, you don't talk about Bruno, you know, you just don't talk about it. And so getting that diagnosis was like, aha, <laughs> I get it now. Okay, oh, makes sense. <laughs> yes. And even for my daughters, uh, for Paris, it was, that was the first diagnosis. Paris is my oldest daughter, she's four. It was a little tougher because it was the first diagnosis. It was the first I have to understand. And it was the, it was kind of like, well, she's already a black woman and I'm already going to have to navigate all of that. And now I have to navigate neurodiversity. It's so tough, but I'm a planner. So research, plan, plan, plan. Um, and then with my second daughter, to be quite honest, uh, it, this might not sound right, but it was kind of relief because I was like, well, that would be so hard for her being the neurotypical sister to the autistic sister and autistic, you know, <laughs> and so at least we're all, you know, part of the gang of being different. <laughs> and <laughs> so yes, definitely relief. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. I saw it just a Thing, a chat pop up I didn't read the whole thing but just how you model this your modeling of just the courage the empowering route to say we're gonna figure this out we're gonna make a plan like even the reparenting that you did with your own mother of you know really looking at that trauma walking right up to that trauma and saying I'm gonna I'm gonna take control of this I'm gonna do my own therapy we're gonna do this together just the modeling around that is just amazing. Thank you so much for just your humor and your sense of like, I think it's so empowering to, to, for all people who are watching this to say like, you're not alone, you know? And I think that piece of like, we don't, I love that you said, we don't talk about Bruno because it's yeah. that part, right? Like we don't talk about it. And I mean, I think I so much, I want to ask about, you know, one of the pieces that you mentioned was the soothing, the sensory signs that were always there for you, that your daughters, how incredible they have, the mother that they have, the lucky ducks, you know, to just have right be in it. And when you bring positive discipline tools combined with the sensory piece, and you know me, I work with early years, I've got three daughters myself, worked in the schools as a psychologist and counselor for almost 20 years. And there's so much that people are not talking about this sensory continuum. And every time I would get these students with, you know, quote unquote challenges or, you know, problems in the classroom or in my preschool assessment clinics, the sensory would show up time and time again. And I feel like all roads lead there. Like that was never getting addressed. And so then you were never able to help them through their routines and make the connections and do the reasoning and do the relatedness like we talk about with Bruce Perry's work because the regulation was never there. And so what are some of the gems? Like, I love that you even just showed the water bottle. I talk about that a lot within a positive timeout space, like always have something where kids can suck on it. People like mm -hmm. you just have to, there's gotta be the straw, right? It's so mm -hmm. soothing. And so thinking about those, your soothing, self-soothing techniques that you use, the, the, sort of hacks or like ways or superpowers that you've found, right? Which is how we love to talk about it with our students. Like, what's your superpower? Oh, you don't have one. It's almost like, you know, that's weird. So how would you say, um, 
how would you say with some of these tools with positive discipline, like, again, I'm thinking about routines or the positive timeout space or just emo- emotional regulation. What have been some of those gems that you've found to be really helpful through that sensory lens for young children? Absolutely. So first let's talk about the time in corner or a common corner. You know, it has many names. Um, I had, I created my own because again, you know, we needed something that showed black faces and multicultural. Faces. And I have to be, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I have to tell Casey, right. Tell everyone your website that has specifically the calming corner with so many resources, like everybody open up your browser, go to that tab and like, look at Natasha's calming corner section because it is brilliant. So I just have to put a plug in there. Keep going. Okay. (laughs) But the idea is that no one child copes the same way. And that I know everybody wants kids to um and take deep breaths and count, but that's not realistic. And if we're talking about neurodivergent people, that may not be how I calm down. And so I may want to bang something. I may want to bang a drum. I may want to squeeze something because that's a part of my uh, senses because we don't just have the five outside senses, we have internal senses, like our proprioceptive sense, like our vestibular sense that tells us we need to move and that we need to feel and that we need to squeeze. And so I may need a weighted blanket um, and to be rolled up like a burrito. I may need to tear up paper. I may need to drink from a straw Um, instead of just the take deep breaths and count to four and, you know, and the, 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 that, and those do work, of course, but for a neurodivergent child, and honestly, I say this all the time. Yes, most of my stuff is for neurodivergent children, but I really think it's for everybody. Mm-hmm. I, I, I really do. I really think it's for everybody. I think everybody doesn't want to just breathe and count sometimes. I think everybody sometimes gets really angry and wants to tear up some paper or maybe bang on a drum. And I think <laughs> that making that Especially open. When, yeah, our, when our breathing is actually hyperventilating. <laughs> yes. Because sometimes my proprioceptive sense doesn't tell me that I'm hyperventilating. So okay. I don't know that I'm not breathing. I don't know that my heart is beating super fast until someone calls it out to me or I'm starting to have a panic attack. Mm -hmm. Um, And so having some some tools that allow me to identify what's going on in my body and then identify what I need and having choices, not just breathe, count, having choices that are already made available for that child because you know that child needs to jump on a trampoline or you know that child needs a weighted vest or you know that child needs a cup, sippy cup that's always in the room that has a straw and allowing them to choose what they need to deal with those emotions as that in itself is is so helpful in this household. Um, My children like choice as most human beings do. And my children like choices that they know are going to support them because every human is different. And when you add neurodiversity onto there, it gets even more fun and different. Um, So that's a big one for us. Routines are also big for us, but inside of our routine is also a sensory diet. What I mean by that is I have a neurodivergent child who is what we call a sensory seeker and a neurodivergent child who is what we call a sensory avoider. My sensory seeker needs all of the sensory. She wants to feel the grass and throw it in her hair and smell it in her face and roll in it. And my sensory avoider is like, oh my God, grass is so spiky. Why does it smell like that? Oh my God. (laughs) And so I have to make a routine that takes into account both of them. And so when my sensory seeker comes home from, from play, she still wants to do a sensory bin. So I have to have a sensory bin ready for her. She still wants to go outside and either go on a playground. If it's a rainy day, we have a little smaller jungle gym and swing inside the house she needs movement. Whereas my younger sensory avoider, as soon as she gets home from therapy, we lay down in the dark with some white noise. She has her suction cup. She lays, she tells me about her day very quietly. We might read a book and then we slowly maybe turn on some lights and then do a small activity. But it's not, her day is not full of sensory and jumping and moving because she'll have a meltdown. 
it's overwhelming for her. She's already had to do therapy and list, answer questions and do trials and play with other children. And so when she gets home, she doesn't need any of that. And so being mindful with your routines of the needs of your children and their senses is another big part of me pulling from Adler and positive discipline. And then the last one is gonna be mistakes are learning opportunities because I'm autistic, <laughs> they're autistic. <laughs> We're making plenty of mistakes. We're losing our tempers. We're being overwhelmed. <laughs> and so understanding that mistakes are learning opportunities and we can recover is a very big thing in this house. <laughs> That's incredible. I really, I'm, I was like taking so many notes because there are just so many gems in what you said. And just even this, you know, to me, I think about you know, Jane Nelson, of course, the brilliance of positive discipline around connect before correct. And even that connection piece, how highly intuitive you are in the way that you connect with your children and that you all, that you really come at it from such a sweet curiosity and a true like embracing of the different temperaments and really understanding that Adlerian looking at the child through their eyes, like really getting below what's happening and understanding so deeply and with such curiosity for the toolkit that works for them so personally. And I love that you said, it, and it works for all kids, like ding, 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 you know, what a beautiful model for how to do this with all, all children. Yeah. And the sensory diet. I mean, I think that that term, um, I'm so appreciate you bringing that to awareness that Sensory diet really means that you have to strategically put it in the, their routine in order to titrate up or down their level so that their systems don't get overwhelmed and they head into meltdown city and they feel unsafe. So, yeah. And as I listen to, you know, Natasha, my, my peeps are the parents of teenagers and mostly the people I work with are, are parents who, you know, it's not specific to neurodivergent. I seem to get a lot of parents with teens that are navigating uh, deep discouragement and some men borderline mental health stuff. And I really, what really stood out to me was you saying, you know, even though it's specific around neuro, you know, we're talking neurodivergent, it's helpful for everyone. And I'm immediately, of course, going to my own two teenagers, 19 and 16, and recognizing, yeah, the way that I interact with them is really different because I know them and what it is they need in them. Well, I'm some like, if we're keeping it real, when I'm in my regulated conscious space, I'm meeting them where they're at, right? Or doing my best to at least make guesses around what they need. So I think it's really important that that message, because I, of course, we all love positive discipline. I love positive discipline. It's changed my life and it isn't a, it isn't a formula, right? And, and when you have kids who are neurodivergent, you know, you're kind of forced into recognizing, oh, I got to tweak this to make it work. But there's a lot of parents, I think that don't recognize that and just see the tools and see the, you know four steps to blah, 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 or read the blogs or whatever. And then it's like, oh, but I did the thing and it's not working. And so I'm, I'm just really kind of marinating in the conversation around, you know, at first it's first it's who's the kid and then play with the thing, mm -hmm. you know, and look to be, look for, look for how it's helpful versus did it work? So yeah. Do yeah. you, you know, oh, I'm so sorry, go ahead. No, you. An example of that would be, um, the cut, you know, with connection before correction, we talked about that. The activity that is in our books that we, that we use is, can I have a hug? I don't, mm -hmm. I use that, but I modify that because I make it for us. Right. And so in my, not all kids want a hug. Not mm -hmm. all kids, I, not all kids are social kids are uh, neurodivergent children are social made. Not all of them want a hug. And so we say, connection before correction. We call it exercise instead of, can I have a hug? Connection before correction. Because the idea is, do you know how your child connects? Because first, that's the first step. How does your child connect with you? Is it a high five? Is it watching a movie together? Is it what? Is it rolling them in a burrito? What is your connection with your child? 
And then from there, doing that before correction, because connection before correction, it ain't got to be a hug. Make it I love, hug. I love this so much, Natasha. I just, you, am I, I have a 10 year old. She just turned 10 Violet. She's my middle and she will not hug. It's like, she'll every once in a while, she'll turn around and back up into the oh, hug. That's the worst. It's, it's the, it's right. Fun. But she will not. And sometimes I joke and I'll just like force her in, you know, and I'll just like give her a little, but you know what she loves is tickling her back. Yes. she calls it like backy or what I don't even know like she'll and so when I can get her in that calm state and I'll just tickle her back or she'll just kind of rub up and like like open up an arm for me you know and I know that's her bid for connection in that way and it's so sweet and it's like that's just the kid that I have you know she was my colicky kid like it just is and just understanding and knowing who your child is or who your students are, you know? And even that piece, I think is so important that you talked about the differences between your, your children who one, they have to be regulated up and one have to be regulated down. And all of the nuance between that, you mentioned the weighted vest or the wiggly piece, or even just the sensory with the lights off. And so understanding, I think, you know, like you were saying, Casey, with positive discipline tools, like it's not a formula, you know? And so we all were regulating ourselves, they're regulating themselves. And then that's when we can be in relationship to then be comfortable to do the family meetings and, you know, check for understanding and look at the belief behind the behavior, or have them be able to do the bug and the wish. I mean, all those things, you know, all roads, like I said, all roads lead back first to that first step, you know, that sense of regulation. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, her little because when we yeah. talk about belief behind the behavior, sometimes the belief behind the behavior is sensory. And so you have to add like a sensory block to the, the mistaken goal chart if you're a neurodivergent parent of did I take care of my child's sensory needs? Are they overwhelmed? Are they under stimulated? Uh, and keeping that in mind outside of just you know, is this a power struggle? Is this an attention issue? Is this a revenge issue? Is this a, uh, excuse me, assumed inadequacy issue? Yeah. So, yeah. Do you ever, you mentioned just having parents, I think it's, it's so cool to me that you have parents that are just reparenting themselves that don't even have kids. I mean, talk about how powerful positive discipline is that it's mm -hmm. helpful for all human beings, even outside of parenting, right? Do you ever, I've had some parents um, who have also discovered in their adult life that they are on the spectrum and, and really have a hard time playing with kids, like because of those social cues that they aren't able to read their kids in a certain way. You also talk about the intersectionality with trauma as well, and just how that can change the brain as well. I don't even, I mean, how do you, how do you help support parents that have that, that might you know, because of the way that they were parented either with trauma or because being on the spectrum with those socials, we're not, they're not able to read those cues from their children. What do you, how do you help them? So a few things happen here. Um, finding a language that works for you and your children. A lot of times we are very much just stuck on verbal language. We are. Um, but you can use communication cue cards to communicate with your children. You can use sign. You can use videos. We use scripts sometimes. Uh, my children pull scripts from movies, TV shows. I do it too. I'm very bad about it. I'll just, you heard me just randomly say, we don't talk about Bruno. Uh, so, uh, but you pull I think that everybody needs to watch Encanto. That comes from yeah. the movie Encanto. Yeah. So we're like, what's this Bruno conversation? Go watch yeah. that movie. <laughs> and so scripts basically are for neurodivergent people we'll watch a video or we'll watch you, a person interacting and we'll see the back and forth of that. And we'll pull that exact conversation or song or video and use it in the right context and something in our lives. And it helps us if we're uncomfortable with social interacting, it helps us if it over processes us to think about a response. We already have one ready that we know is favorable. Um, it just helps in a lot of different ways. And so learning the TV shows and scripts and things that your children like to help you is important. But then it's also important as a parent to have boundaries and to be honest about who you are. So I'm neurodivergent and you can't do a whole bunch of hooping and hollering around me. It terrifies me. I also have PTSD as a veteran. And I'm very honest about that. Paris, you can jump over there. You can jump into your playroom. You can jump, but you can't jump on mommy. We can do something else. Would you like to read a book? Would you like to do a puzzle? Would you like, but I'm not the jumper. 
that's your daddy. <laughs> that's not my thing. And that is okay. You don't have to make yourself be the jumper. If that's your boundary, if you're a neurodivergent person, if that triggers you, don't do it. Find an alternative. I love, so this is something that I get really excited about just in the general positive discipline conversation, because I feel like sometimes parents are taking all this information in and they're missing, they're missing permission to hold boundaries and be a human. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Is, okay. Like mutual <laughs> respect means that you are respecting yourself as well. And what you talked about earlier, just around your discovery of PD and moving through kind of like the gentle, you know, there's a lot of catchphrases. And I, I totally resonated with what you said, because, you know, respectful boundaries are are, are for everyone, right? And so thank you for that really clear, um, that really clear modeling of, of what it can sound like with a young children, or even, I mean, change the language just slightly and with a with a feisty teenager as well. So mm -hmm. and yeah, full permission, <laughs> set your boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> Still yeah. a loving parent, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. so brilliant. And also the emotional honesty. We see that in our mistaken goal chart and positive discipline. One of the tools is emotional honesty. And for you to show up with such confidence and firmness through that mutual respect of this is why it's not okay for me. And here's what it is. And here's why, you know, is just incredible. Yeah, I'm, I have, I have chills. Also, such brilliance around, I just want to highlight again for the audience, the brilliance around using scripts using conversation cards, using all the tools within nonverbal. And I think that can be a misnomer of positive discipline also is that that's really too talky, you know? Mm -hmm. And so really how you've fleshed out the use of videos. I mean, we even, Leona and I, you know, I've got my four-year-old, we do these, um, this company is called Eboo, whatever no affiliation with them. I wish I could fill, figure out this whole affiliation thing, but they have these things called, I heard, um, I heard your feelings and they're conversation cards. And each night she picks one and it's just a picture of animals. And there's different questions on the back. That's like, what do you think dog is feeling? What do you think would have happened with rabbit or what is going on there? How could you, in fact, the one that we had last night was, um, I'm just going to keep going with this. I don't, I like, now that I've started Rolling the train and left the station, I have to finish this. Sorry. <laughs> but it really was powerful because it was this, this scenario where, and I think Jackie asked about like some opportunities for elementary kids. I think this is a great way to do it too. So like you were saying, Natasha, using pictures, you can use any picture and really help kids to dissect what was going on. What well, was a picture of this dog that was really like in this cat's face and there's a rabbit as this bystander looking on like what do I do and so the question is like how is dog feeling how is cat feeling what should rabbit do what would rabbit do and Leona was like well rabbit needs to go in there and be like dog you know you're not respecting space like get out of cat's you know face like she's real she's my like you know hockey and Kung Fu girl. Right. So, but I was able to say, well, how, hold on. What if that, you know, what if it would be a really scary situation? What if you were feeling threatened or what if your body then was going to get hurt by a dog? How could you also help support cat and just say, Hey, this looks unsafe. And then we did a whole role play where first we were, I was the dog and she was the dog and showing how you could come in and really practice saying, cat, this feels safe. Let's go get help together and not have to get up in dog space, you know? So I just thank you so much for highlighting that tool. And I think the other piece around it that you bring up is that you practice this with your kids. This mm -hmm. is part of just the normal. It's not when you're having an issue or when you're not able to really connect or communicate. It's because this is something that's just part of the fabric of your family. You take time for training, you practice, 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 and you normalize it in a way that's like, Hey, we all need these skills, which again, just to close is good for all kids. Yeah. Okay. I'll stop. Yeah. <laughs> Natasha, you get me so excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Natasha, I have a question for you. What, it, when you think about the parents that you serve or the parents that have yet to find you, and I'm hopeful that they find you, if you could just drop a few little nuggets of what you wish that parents could understand about neurodivergence, um, what, what would those nuggets be? 
Well, the first one is you definitely want to have an understanding of senses. Uh, I, I know we already spoke on that, but it really is important. As a neurodivergent person, most times the wires that they say the way the brain works differently, it's usually connected to our senses. And it's not, even though these are very important, it's not just sight, it's not just hearing, it's not just touch, it's not just taste. It is also your internal senses. So I'm going to give you some examples. Your proprioceptive sense is the sense that tells you, oh, I'm breathing. Oh, I have to pee. Oh, my heart is beating fast. So if that sense isn't getting enough signals to the brain, you may not know you have to pee. And so I could be a bedwetter and I may be getting in trouble or you may be thinking, oh, my child doesn't feel safe or, oh, what, what is the mistaken goal that my child is doing for bedwetting or not potty training? What it could be, they don't feel that they need to go to the restroom mm -hmm. because that sense isn't getting the sensors that it needs. Um, I, your child may, may not be breathing all the time or you may have to actually tell them to breathe because they may not realize that, that, that they, they aren't breathing when they get into a rough situation, when they're upset. And so you may have to actively teach them breath work because their proprioceptive sense may not tell them that. Your child, you, your, their vestibular sense, the one that tells them, you know, balance, movement. You may have a very clumsy child who doesn't have any depth perception. And instead of, you're so clumsy, why didn't you look at that? Just realizing that and maybe getting them into some OT and some PT to help with that vestibular sense. Being aware, maybe making sure that they have knee pads and they have elbow pads and they have a helmet <laughs> and being prepared. So senses are super important, mm -hmm. super important. But then you go to other things. Um, and the reason why I did senses is because like I said, you can be a sensory seeker, a sensory avoider, or you can have the unfortunate fun of being a combo. And what that means is I have some senses where I'm a seeker and some senses where I'm an avoider. Mm -hmm. That's fun because then you got to figure yourself out and other people have to figure you out, right? <laughs> and then, so, but that's important. And then we start talking about other tricks and tools that people give you like routines or communication, realizing that it's not one size fits all. You may have one child who loves routines, sticks to routines, hates, you know, change. And then you may have another child who really can't stick to a routine. If they don't, that's not their thing. They need more time. They need timers and transitions and, and moving on. And so realizing that along with these great tools, you still have to figure out what works for your child because your child is a human. And just like every little girl is different, every autistic little girl is different. Same mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Julietta, do you just feel like you could listen to Natasha all day long? I just <laughs> like what else running and singing in the back is like, I just keep in my head as like, will you promise me that we'll have another conversation? <laughs> like, well, this will not be the goodbye after this. I, um, yeah. And I know there's a lot in the chat. Casey, are there, do you want to lead us to some questions there? Just so we make sure we... Well, there's not a lot of questions. There's just a lot of thank you and great information. And I love this. And, um, and you mentioned, you know, Jackie had asked around ideas for elementary age tools that could be used at lunchtime or playground areas kind of in more unstructured time when there are a lot of needs. Jackie, if you want to kind of get more, give us a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, but just, there's just a lot of love in the chat, Natasha. So thank you for how mm -hmm. articulate you are in talking about all of this. I knew that this was going to be a great conversation. I, I was, I wasn't so prepared for like how much, you know, I mean, I knew you knew a lot, but I'm sitting here just like, damn, Natasha, thank you. Thanks for the science and the brain development. Cause this is, there's a lot of new things all those sensory words that you just shared. <laughs> I don't have any, I don't, I, that's all new to me. So well, I, and I was going to about the internal senses. We always get taught five senses. Yeah. Time. Right. I'm like, what about like what we see? Well, and I was going to say, I mean, just as much as I, I do know about proprioceptive and vestibular systems. And I, as I have never been able to explain it in the way that you just explained it is so crystal clear and simple and lovely. And I just 
wish I had had those words all these years. But it sounds like you do have some ideas. Maybe you can speak to, to Jackie's question about what to do during the unstructured times. So you're not going to like my answer, Jackie, but I'm, I'm a positive discipline lover. So I feel like schools don't control the environment and, and they don't give limited choices to children. Like, right. So it's a playground. Yes. But depending on the level and the understanding of that neurodivergent child, there's going to have to be some controlling the environment um, and maybe an aid for that child, depending on the level and needs of that child. Um, so that's one thing to always think about. Um, and then we also go to like limited choices for, for issues and because you're having multiple children on the playground, right? So my Paris, who's the oldest, is mostly, I hate the word nonverbal. She's not really nonverbal. Um, I, when I talk to people who understand autism, I say she's exploring how she wants to communicate. When I talk to people who don't, understand autism, I say she's nonverbal. Um, she speaks maybe sometimes in one or two words, but she doesn't have a back and forth conversation with you. She can't answer questions for you. Mm -hmm. So if my child gets into a conflict on the playground, I'm not going to be able to sit down and say, how can you two work together to fix and come to a solution that's mutually respectful? Like I can with my two-year-old, almost three-year-old, unfortunately, because she doesn't use that kind of language. And so what I usually sit down and do is give limited choices of respectful, related, reasonable, and helpful logical consequences for those children. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's always something to think about too. That's so that. beautiful. Yeah. Just stay in solution focused for those unstructured times. And I think I agree. I mean, I, you know, worked in the schools for a hundred years and recess is chaos. I mean, it's yeah. total chaos. And yeah. so no, as much as you try then. So I love when you keep coming back to, well, then how can we structure it? How can we give some control? How can we give choices? How mm -hmm. can we put a big wheel of choice up out on the mm -hmm. playground mm -hmm. so that when kids are having problems, it's a visual piece of what do you want to do? And part of it might be that sensory diet, that break over here, you yeah. know, just to reset and I'll say, oh, let's go over here. And even for the kids that are nonverbal, I'll say, let's take a break and let's look at the kids that are being safe. Show me three kids that are playing in a way that's safe, that's helpful, and they're having fun. And how can we go join and giving them some, some support to transition back into that group as well. But yeah, I so appreciate that you're like, I'm a positive discipline lover. Like, Hey, get, there's gotta be some choice, limited choices there. There has to be yeah. that firmness, right? With and some controlling of the environment. And mm -hmm. I love what you said. You know, we always think of time in corner as like this calm, soothing space, but why not having a time in corner on the playground? So it's a place where maybe you can throw a ball against a wall or, or it's maybe a standard, standard, standard swing or something um, where they're not feeling like they're in timeout, but hey, maybe you need some space from everyone, you know, play into yourself for a bit. Mm -hmm. Well, and I like to think about creating a container, right? Like if I'm float, if I'm treading water in the middle of the ocean, it is terrifying. I can't see the edge. I don't know how deep it is, but treading water in a pool where I can, I can get to the edge. I can get to the wall. I can get to help if I need it. And I feel like the playground is like the ocean. Like the container is so big. The possibilities are so endless that I can imagine how for some kids, it's just too much space. Mm -hmm. Right. And so creating a container and I'm looking to at um, Carla's question about working with kids in preschool classrooms who maybe haven't had any um, early intervention, you know, like that comes to mind for thinking about you too, Carla, like how do we create a container? Right. I mean, you know, that's between the entire room versus like the weighted vest. How do we can, you know, what are some ideas like, and everybody, we can all be creative around this to create that space that feels safe for, for all kids. And, and I think we all feel comfortable in different size, you know, energetic containers, but that comes to mind too. I, my first job in a school was playground aid. And I was like, what am I doing? They are not paying me enough. This is the worst. <laughs> they are not paying me enough. <laughs> well, and I think that's also where the beauty of, I mean, class meetings are. And I'd love to hear even how family meetings are probably in your family. Natasha, I'd love to just 
be on your couch during your family meeting too. I mean, thinking about that, coming up with those creative solutions, how can we make all of our friends feel safe on the playground, you know? And I think you're modeling of just empowering, like, this is what I have. This is my superpower. I have ADHD. I have autism. I have, you know, these other things that make these certain aspects of recess feel unsafe for me and giving our kids those voices in order to say those things in a class meeting, you know, scaffolding, it's not going to be right out of the gate in first grade, but creating a culture in your school, Jackie, and for others where that is embraced and talked about and come up with solutions and good creative ideas for your particular space. Mm -hmm. Like even thinking about now they have it like venues, you know, they have sensory rooms for kids and families, which are so awesome, like a sporting, you know, and so I don't know. I'm just wondering even things like that, where we need to level up with schools to just embrace that and have that as part of it. Yeah, normalize yeah. it, normalize yeah. it. Right? Harris's preschool has the playground and then they also have a sensory room. Um, and so some of the children, cause you know, I hate the language, but they use, you know, high functioning and, and, and not as high functioning. And so some of those the children who they don't deem as high functioning, they don't take to the playground because they know it's overwhelming but they get to go to the sensory room and they play in the sensory room. And so being mindful of that too, it's not you're, de you're depleting the child. That is overwhelming. Like I hated the playground. I used to read books. <laughs> Once again, somebody should have do. I used to go to a corner of the playground with books. And, and yes, we are talking elementary school <laughs> and yeah. go to the playground in the corner with books and read. I hated the playground. And it's not that I didn't like to play. I was outside all day at home, but the playground is overwhelming. It really is. It really is. I'm looking at the time. I cannot believe, I cannot believe how quickly the time just went by. Uh, do we have any last words from, from, from our guests, from you, Jules, like what's, how are we going to, I mean, I, this is, I don't feel like we should stop, but I'm looking I at can't, the I'm looking at all of my, all of my notes. I think just one, I wouldn't, would love to hear just any final words. I want you to have the last word, Natasha. And I just want to also highlight, I feel like we have not even done enough justice to the fact that you've mentioned a few times your two tours in Afghanistan. Yeah. Being I mean, in the military. Like, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation that I think that we want to have. And I just want to say like so much more beyond, thank you for your service, but just your courage and bravery and incredible accomplishments is just absolutely awe inspiring. I feel like after this conversation, I need to like go do a lot of things to really like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. But I want you to have the last word. Yeah. Um, the only thing that I think we didn't talk about and I think I can cover in three minutes would not take over too much time is the difference between tantrums and meltdowns. We said something about meltdowns, but we didn't really talk about it. Um, and so the idea is to understand that a tantrum has a goal. I want to do something or you're not giving me something, something that triggered me that I'm upset about. Whereas a meltdown is either a sensory, social or emotional overwhelming overstimulation and I'm melting down. So either sensory wise or emotionally, or I'm a social avoider and you've put me in a big social situation with all these people and I am overstimulated and overwhelmed. And so there's no trigger. There is no um, regulation really that you, you can't tell these people to breathe and all of those things. It's kind of something you have to, I call it riding the wave. Mm -hmm. So what we do for a meltdown is what the person needs. And what I mean by that is what we've already talked about, sensory. So my sensory avoider, we put her in a, it's a dark room. We're taking, we don't try to touch her. We're just there with our presence, but we don't touch her. We put on white noise so that if there's any other noises that could excite her, they don't, they're muffled. Um, and we're just there to support her and we're riding the wave, we're removing sensory. For my sensory seeker, we roll her up like a burrito in a weighted blanket. We put on uh, the, her little twilight so that there's lights, like soothing lights, but soothing lights flashing on the ceiling. And with I'm there and sometimes I lay on the burrito with her because she loves that pressure. She mm -hmm. needs that feeling. She needs that touch. And we'll give her something soothing to suck on. Usually her, her 
cup with a straw. Um, and she gets through that meltdown. And it's not a time, it's not a set time frame. It could be anywhere from 20 minutes to two hours. Um, and usually after they're exhausted because it's emotionally and physically overwhelming and they sleep. Whereas a tantrum with, with the right tools, connection before correction, coping strategies, you can usually regulate a tantrum between one to 20 minutes, depending on how you regulate. Um, but also being mindful if you're not regulating a tantrum, if you're not, then it can turn into a meltdown. But a meltdown isn't going to turn into a tantrum. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. You know, just three minutes more of like mic drop moments from <laughs> Natasha Nelson, everyone. My, my mind is blown. <laughs> I mean, that is so, that is so brilliant. I want every single person to know this. I, I am going to, will you go? We, yes, we'll do. We'll do. <laughs> we'll make plans. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, Natasha. We're going to make sure that everybody has links to your website and to your socials. Uh, thanks to everyone who showed up today to watch and participate in the chat. We are so thrilled for the privilege to hold this space each month. Um, yeah, thank you, Positive Discipline, for your partnership. I see Brad and, and Jane were both here watching today. Thank you so much. We love this project. I'm going to speak for Julietta and myself. All of you that are watching, if you're interested in signing up for next month's PDTV Live, we will have the link at besproutable.com slash PDTV. You'll get an email later within the next 24 hours with a replay. We are talking to Aisha Pope, who's a oh. positive discipline lead trainer, clinical social worker, and therapist from La Mesa, California, and one of the creators of the positive discipline tool cards for kids. Yes. So, so that'll be amazing too. So be sure to come hang out with us. It'll be the last Friday of April, 10 a.m. Pacific. You'll see our follow us and you'll, you'll be informed. Yay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Natasha. Thanks, Jules. Thanks for Everyone having have me. Have a beautiful Thank day. Yes. Bye-bye. Real moments are learning moments.